So uh, Steve was talking a little bit about the phrases of recovery, you know, and um, if I'm honest, like I, when they were introduced to me, I didn't like any of them. I thought they were um, trite. I thought they didn't cover what was really happening. I, I thought somebody made them up because they were like, sort of like a little smarty. I thought they were way too cute for the kind of struggle that I was in the middle of. And I basically spent uh, the better part of two years um, rejecting them out of hand. The two of them that gave me the most trouble still do. Unfortunately, we're on one of them tonight, life on life's terms, you know, and the other one is, which I've talked about before, is the whole one day at a time thing, you know, like, I mean, I pretty much suck at both of those. And that's just how it is. And like, the difference now and 10 years ago is now I do actually, I can actually say, I do accept the fact that these statements are true. Now, ask me, do you like them? Absolutely not. You know, so like, if you're, if you're in this place where you're like, I really think all these stupid phrases they talk about are just ridiculous. Like, get it, we get it, I get it. You don't, um, I don't think you have to like these to learn from them. You know, I've learned that along the way. Um, I'm not sure I'll ever, I don't think I'll ever accept, uh, and uh, maybe when I'm dead, but I don't think on this, in this life, I'll ever accept the one day at a time thing. I just, I mean, I can say it out loud. I get the concept. I can teach it. I can hear it. I actually can sit here and tell you, this is the thing about recovery, right? I mean, I can tell you that it works. And I can tell you that life on life's terms that we're gonna talk about tonight works. But I can also tell you that I don't like it. One of the things about recovery that like I've had to learn is, the stuff that is important for me, I don't necessarily have to like. You know, like, if you read, there's a story in the Bible that teaches me this, and it's a guy about a guy named Jonah. And we've talked about, we've talked about this guy before in here. I'm not gonna get into the story. Read the story. At the beginning of the story, Jonah does not like what God is trying to teach him. At the end of the story, Jonah does not like what God is trying to teach him. Somewhere in between, God saved his life. He does not like what God was trying to teach him. Are you following me? Some stuff that's important for us, some stuff that saves our lives in recovery, we just got to understand that we're never going to like it. You know, it's the way we're wired. It's whatever. We're never going to like it. Life on, life on life's terms is um, one of those places for me. And like the question that I want to start with is this one is, what happens to you when um, experiences that you're in the middle of or transitional experiences, like things that you didn't expect to happen, you're in the middle of a major change that maybe you didn't expect, what happens to you when, that, when that's going on? And what happens to you when um, chaos breaks out. You know, so here is, um, here's some examples of stuff like that. There are a lot of people at the airport. It's why, you know, it's, there's reasons why things are different places, but um, you, you go to an airport, right? If you go to a larger airport, there is food about every seven feet. You know, there's another food place, right? You go on down. I mean, not here in Knoxville, there's one, but in a real airport, there's like about every seven feet, there's a restaurant. Do you know why that is? Number one, because people can make money because you can't go anyplace else. But number two, they are fully aware of the fact that there are tremendous numbers of nervous people in that airport. What do nervous people like to do? Eat. So why not have those there, right? So you know you've got people at an airport that are not comfortable, a lot of people, with what's gonna happen next. You know, they're concerned about well, is this gonna be a safe flight? Are we gonna have bad weather? Is, you know, is it gonna be late? Is it gonna be, I've never, I mean, you can have people, you can take 20 people. Those 20 people are late people, right? Like they're always late. They're late for a movie. They don't, they don't even, they're past the previews when they walk in. When they come here on Sunday for the 10 o'clock service, they're rolling in about 10.35, right? When they are gonna pick up their kids at school, their kid is the last kid sitting outside waiting for dad or mom to pick them up. They're late for softball practice. They're late for their kid's soccer game. They're late, for, they're, they're late because they're just late. 
But now, you put them in a position of being at an airport and you put them on a plane and someone goes, uh, we intend to be uh, have an on-time arrival today, but uh, or it's gonna be close to it. We might be four minutes late. They are gonna jump out of the plane with just being deranged about the fact that they're gonna be, wait, seven minutes late. It's like, listen, Star, you started off your life seven minutes late. You're always late, but see now and now, when you fly in a plane, you lose your mind because why? You're not in control. You know, me, it's like my thing, as you know, is going to Walmart and waiting in line to give them my money. You know, it's like, why don't I use the self-checkout? Those things are demonic, evil, horrible. There are criminal activity involved with those at every level. And lastly, lastly, how long before I not only got to stock the shelves and buy the product, and now I got to check my stupid self out? What is that? Am I going to be serving lunch to Walmart next? You're like, maybe you are, sucker. Maybe you are. But I mean, like, lines are my thing. Some of you, some of you, it's traffic that makes you crazy. You know, like, you used to be able to outfox traffic with this app called Waze. You heard of it? And so like Waze was a great thing until all of freaking America got Waze. Now the way you were gonna go, everybody else is already there. You might as well stay where you are. People go crazy in hospitals, right? Life on life's terms goes right out the window in a hospital. In a hospital, you're hooked up to stuff. You know, they're doing this, they're doing that, right? You know how people are starting to get better at a hospital? They start to complain. They hate their nurse. Their nurse is a ratchet. They hate her. The food is awful. Everything, this place is just trying to kill me. They don't take care of me. I stay awake all night. It's like time for you to go. Time for you to go. I'm sure physicians and nurses would tell you the same thing. If you're a nurse or a doctor, I'm right, aren't I? Like that's an indicator that someone's getting better. When they're really sick, you're like, yeah, yeah, I just really appreciate the wonderful care you're taking of me. And then when you start to get better, you're like looking at the nurse like you're Chucky. You're evil and you're, I'm gonna get out of here and I'm not gonna eat your stupid tapioca and I want a dang peanut butter sandwich and you're gonna give it to me or someone's gonna die today. It's like, they're better, get out, get out. You know, hospitals are like that. You know what else is like that is what happened this week, hurricanes. So like here I am and I'm, I'm hanging out and spending some time with our oldest daughter and her husband and my grandson over the weekend. Everything's going fine. The weather is nice and all that. We had a little bit of rain on uh, Saturday. Sunday rolls around, it's gorgeous. Hanging out at the pool, we go out to eat dinner. I was supposed to drive them to the airport at like, I don't know, six o'clock or whatever. It was gonna be an okay time. I get home and somehow I look at my phone and I realize that the lovely governor of South Carolina has decided that he's gonna um, create a mandatory evacuation of Hilton Head and places around it, which is okay. I mean, I wouldn't have gone anyway, I don't care. But that you can realize that everybody from New York, Pennsylvania, Kansas, or wherever else they're from does not normally hang out in the low country lost their mind. They had to rush to the airport in Savannah to get on a plane because they were gonna die, even though the storm wasn't gonna get there till Thursday, they were gonna die if they didn't get there, leave right away Monday morning. I have never seen that many people at the Savannah airport at five o'clock in the morning in my life, right? So the flight, the flight, you know, my kids were all flying standby so it means like this, the, the numbers of available seats went from like 40 to negative 10. But my daughter, who is a planner, I don't know where she gets it from, but she is one, man. To the nth degree, we should have a recovery group for planners. <laughs> because we're sitting there showing her, I'm like, Aaron, Listen, the thing is that flight is oversold by like 20 people. Like, I'm gonna go way before you do. You are not getting on. I thought she would back down and go, yeah, that's right. I mean, they were gonna rent a car anyway to drive to Atlanta and, um, and then fly from there. But I, I, mean, I thought she'd go, yeah, you're right, Dad. You know what she said? I still think we should try it. 
Maybe we'll get on. I'm thinking, what do you think? Like somewhere on the way to the airport in Savannah, a T-Rex is gonna show up and eat the people that are on the way? Now, I did not tell her that because if you say something like that to your daughter, they cry is the thing. And then it's just, and then that's a mess. You know what I mean? So I didn't say it, but I thought it. We get to the airport at like, we leave the house at freaking 3.30 in the morning, right? We go to the airport, shocker of shockers. They do not get on. They won't even change their ticket because they, there's like no way. They wait from 4.30 in the morning till seven for the rental place to open up. That's some chaos, right? When there's a hurricane, people go crazy. People go to the store. They act like there's gonna be no, like they act like we're in some remote, remote country of, in the Amazon or somewhere, like there's never gonna be water again. Every single ounce of water goes away. All the bread goes away. It's like, I would like to know if a hurricane was coming right at you. Answer, riddle me this, riddle me this, Batman. If a hurricane is coming right at you and 140 mile an hour winds are coming your way, can you explain to me what the heck a stupid piece of bread is gonna do to protect you? I mean, like, I haven't had somebody go, well, how did you survive? I mean, I stood right out there on the, I stood right out there on the beach at 150 mile an hour hurricane and I was protected. It's like, how did you protect yourself? What was your secret? I covered myself in bread. It's like, oh, but that's what they do. Man, hurricanes cause chaos. Rule number one, life on life's terms. Rule number one, I am not or I am. It's a critical question to be able to handle life on life's terms. I either am or I am not the center of the universe. The center of the universe. Now, if you, if you come to this class tonight, you'll hear this, but if you're in active, you're in an active compulsion tonight, you actually think that you are the center of the universe. The real fact of it is, your compulsion is the center of the universe and you're the imposter. You wanna believe that you're the center of the universe, that you're in charge of everything and everybody else around you is an idiot. The fact of the matter is, your disease is the center of the universe for you. But you gotta answer that question number one. There will be no understanding life on life's terms until you can answer that question, I am not the center of the universe. What is that called? We're gonna be into these here in a few weeks. That's actually called step one, isn't it? If you rename step one, isn't step one, I cannot, I cannot be the center of the universe if God is gonna be the center of the universe. That's the point of that step, isn't it? Is I have to undo my godness. Like I cannot be the center of the universe and deal with life on life's terms. Here's what God has to say. For my thoughts, this is God saying, this is why you cannot be the center of the universe. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isaiah 55. Number two, axiom number two. You're not gonna like this either. Fairness is neither required or a necessity in life. If I took a poll right this second, most people of a random poll will thoroughly disagree with me in our society, in our culture right now, amen? Most people, because the number one problem most of us had, have with our agitation is entitlement. I should have gotten what my sister got. I should have gotten what my brother got. I should have gotten what that guy at work got. That guy should have, if I, that guy got a raise, I should have gotten a raise. The most disturbing part of the Bible for someone in the middle of entitlement is gonna be this story of the Bible where this guy goes out and hires people. He hires a guy, you know, you're gonna be like, if you're, if you're like hype, if you're like hyper into the Bible, I am paraphrasing the story. We're not gonna get all the facts exactly right. Okay, having said that, this guy hires these people. Eight o'clock in the morning, hires this guy. That guy works till five o'clock. He pays him $100. He hires another guy at 11.15. 
You're like, well, no, actually, those stories says it was 10, 11. Well, I don't care. So he hires some other guy at 11, 15. That guy works till five o'clock. How much does he get paid? You ready? A hundred dollars. You're going, that's not fair. I know. Then he hires another guy at two o'clock in the afternoon. Guess what that guy gets? A hundred dollars. Guess what the guy that got hired at four o'clock got? A hundred dollars. Why? Because you're not the center of the universe and you didn't hire them and it wasn't your job to be offered and God was doing every bit of that. And God's understanding of fairness is so far past our understanding of entitlement because you know what God uses to be with you? Love. You know what God uses? Acceptance. You know what God uses? Mercy. Forget the fairness thing. Don't those sound better? If you're in the middle of being entitled tonight, they do not. Fairness is not required or necessity. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, stuff isn't going to be fair. In this world, you're going to have trouble. Take heart, Jesus says. I have overcome the world. What do you want tonight? Do you want fairness or do you want Jesus' victory? Axiom number three. Entitlement that I'm talking about takes, first of all, gratitude. And second of all, joy out of my life. Entitlement takes, first of all, gratitude. And second of all, joy out of my life. One of the hardest things I had to learn when I was first introduced to recovery was this. People kept saying, what are you grateful for? And I'd be like, are you kidding? I mean, my wife is very, very sick. My children don't understand why I can't make it better for them. They're afraid of their mother. They don't know what's gonna happen to her. They don't know how to help her, even though they're just like me, trying to figure out what to do to help. And nothing they're doing and nothing I'm doing is helping. And you, you want me to be grateful? And so they'd be like, well, man, can you be grateful for the fact that you're here? And I'm like, no, I don't even want to be here. And so this one woman said to me early on and on, let me just ask you a question. Are you grateful for your kids? And about 35 minutes later, I stopped crying. Because she got, she got to the one thing in my life that I could be grateful for. And man, that was a game changer. Full on entitlement, no gratitude, no gratitude, no joy. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Lamentations 3. Axiom number four. Life on life's terms. Do not run. Do not run. In active compulsion, all we know is running. Do not run. Avoidance is unhealthy. Avoidance is unhealthy. It just makes us sicker. God says, be still, don't run, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with me. Say that. The Lord Almighty is with me. The God of Jacob is our fort. Don't run. And axiom number five. Adversity creates learning and growth. Adversity creates learning and growth. Do you believe that adversity can actually cause you to develop a much more loving relationship with God? Do you believe that going through hell in your life can put you in a place with God where you're not sure you're gonna be thankful that God rescued you, 
But do you understand that adversity with God can also take you to a place where you tr begin to trust God and you begin to bank that trust for the next adversity? And someone's gonna go to you, you go to your next adversity in your life, right? And they go, well, what's gonna happen? What do you think is gonna happen? And you go, you know, I really don't know what's gonna happen. But you know what I do know is I do know who is gonna happen. I know that God is gonna happen because I'm gonna pull that, I'm gonna pull that investment I made in my trust of God out of my trust bank and I'm gonna put it to use when right now for any other way without having it in the bank, I would never be trusting anything except honestly the chaos. Adversity can create learning and growth and even sometimes freedom. Even sometimes freedom being like, sometimes it's like, you know, it's one thing to go, well, I mean, how did it, how did it go? Well, you know, I dodged that bullet. It's something else altogether to go, well, how did that go? Well, man, that experience right there, <laughs> it really defeated me. I mean, like, I got fired. I mean, I was out of work. I mean, I'm, I'm watching someone that uh, used to come here go through this right now. You know, um, got sober here, got a year clean here, started working at a really good job again. Was looking for a job right now because his company just completely went to crap. And when I'm talking to him, I'm, you know, when I'm like, look, here we are a year later in something like, do you believe that the main thing for you is staying clean and sober? And do you understand that you're gonna get the job you know, you're gonna get the job as long as you stay clean and sober. Not as a reward, but because you're gonna be your best self, clean and sober. And it's not the obsession about the adversity, it's the can you be obsessed about, can you be obsessed about what God is doing in your life? Can you realize again that Jesus is enough? How do you handle adversity? You ask yourself, if everything else goes completely to crap, will Jesus be enough? Like that's how you do it. There, there, isn't, there isn't some fancy way to do it, that's how you do it. You don't, you don't build yourself up, you know, and try to be a great cheerleader. You go, if everything else goes completely to crap, is Jesus gonna be enough for me? And do I believe that he's gonna hold me in his arms? Do I believe that he's gonna hold me in his arms? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, adversity, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything, James 1. Life on life's terms, man, it's, uh, it's some kind, it is a crazy way to live. But let me just tell you, when it happens, there's nothing better. There's nothing better. We're gonna open this space for some prayer time tonight while we sing our last song. I wanna thank you for being here in Jesus' sweet name, amen.